Well, good morning, and as Debbie said, my name's James, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here at City Church. So glad that you can join us this morning as we start this new teaching series called Being Human. Uh, I wonder if you could turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, which is where we're going to start, and we're going to read the first few verses together. So it's this, Paul, Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love and in your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I've been living with a heavy heart for a couple of weeks now, as I'm sure many of you have done too, as we have witnessed the recent events unfold in America. The, v- the footage of George Floyd's murder by someone who was there to protect him. The footage of Ahmaud Aubrey being gunned down by two men in a truck whilst he was out on a run. The shooting of Breonna Taylor in March, a medical technician who worked in a hospital, took 20 bullets in her own home. And I've not been able to shake those images out of my mind. And that's been the problem. I've been able to do that before. I have something of a gift of being able to sideline uncomfortable, painful and conflicting thoughts and ideas so that I can essentially carry on with my life. It's something that I'm not proud of and yet it's true. And when I was a history teacher I would regularly teach about some horrific events in history and then once the bell went I was able to flick a switch and suddenly became frustrated that someone who was supposed to bring cake into the office forgot to. But on a far more serious level, I can take in the news, I can read the stories, and I have a choice to make. Do I ignore it and pretend like it never happened, or do I seek to understand something of it, educate myself, feel the weight of it, understand how it affects others, listen to people's experiences, ask questions, consider my own perspectives and blind spots, talk about it and help to bring change. And here's why it's important to talk about it. And to my shame, I haven't talked about it enough. On one level, it feels like it's a complex situation, particularly in America with its history and its government. And each tragic story has its own backstory. And so I know I can shy away from engaging with it because it's this thing happening over there. But on another level, at a fundamental level, what we are seeing is incredibly simple to understand. What we are seeing in our news feeds and on our social media is nothing short of evil. That is what we're seeing. Evil manifesting itself in racism, racist attacks, and the killing of people because of the colour of their skin. And this is therefore not primarily a political issue, but rather a gospel issue. You see, justice and unity is at the very heart of who God is. And where there is pain and suffering and injustice, that is where God's heart is. And so to be a Christian is to be moved by what concerns God most. We need to recognise that it's not just something that is happening on the other side of the Atlantic, but that it remains a significant issue here in the UK. In fact, we need to recognise that racism is more than just murder. And that the reality is that most racism isn't newsworthy it's mostly subtle and it's on our doorsteps 
and therefore we must take it seriously. And so that's one side of the coin. We should care because God cares and it's closer to us than we think. We're moved because God is moved by this. We cry out to God and we call for justice and mercy because that is who he is and we are his children. The other side of the coin is that this lands in our church family. We have dear brothers and sisters in our church family with which this lands all the more. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, When one part of the body suffers, every part suffers with it. And for those who are black in our church, this is another tragedy in a long, 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 long list of tragedies in which someone has been brutally attacked because of their skin colour. And for those uh, that, that this particularly affects, this is something that has become predictable, exhausting and heartbreaking. And as a church, we want to get around our family members that are grieving. Even in our lockdown, social, socially distanced world, we want to stand with you and say we are praying for you. We are grieving alongside you. You know, what, I, what I've seen has led me to tears. What I have recognised in my own life has made me angry and frustrated and whilst there is so much to talk about and discuss and I'm certainly no expert on the subject at all but as a pastor in this church I want to say that we are sorry that we haven't done better on this and spoken more about it and we want to make space for us to hear and to listen and to also speak into it and so my prayer is that as we consider God's word this morning, we would each have soft hearts and a sober mind to hear the voice of God in this. That as a church family, we would collectively feel the weight of what is going on around us and that it would lead to action. So I hope that's okay. I know that's a heavy intro and normally you would start a new teaching series with bells and whistles and all the historical context and background to the series but to be honest you can go away and watch a bible project video on one thessalonians and you'll probably no you'll definitely uh, learn more uh, there than hearing it from me anyway and so today here's the bottom line for us what we see in verse three of those verses it's not just a definition of what it means to be a flourishing human being, but also what it means to be the flourishing community of human beings that God has called us to be. And Paul is writing to this church in Thessalonica that he has planted. And as he writes to them, he is thanking God for them because he is remembering what they were like. And he calls to mind these three things. He calls to mind their work produced by faith, their labour prompted by love, and their endurance inspired by hope. So let's just look at those three things in turn. Let's start with what Paul says, which is your work produced by faith. And this is what Paul calls to mind. This is what he starts by remembering the Thessalonians who put their faith into practice. Paul remembers the way in which their work and actions came out of the faith they professed. You see, many people profess faith, but they don't possess faith. You know, faith isn't just a set of ideas or preferences or a list of rules or values. Faith is putting your full trust in something, knowing that it is true, and then allowing that reality to shape and influence how you live. You know, I can say I believe in the uh, structural integrity of this sofa, but if I decide to not use it and sit on it, well, what's the point of having it? It's useless. And the Bible never asks you to believe in something that isn't true, but it also never asks you just to take it as an interesting thought or idea. God calls us to stand on what is true that there is a God who made the world, who made all of humanity in his own image, a humanity whom he loved. 
And that even in our rebellion and brokenness against him, he would continue to call us back to himself. In fact, he's so committed to us that his one and only son, Jesus, would go to the cross as a punishment for our sin so that we could stand before a holy and righteous God and not die, but rather have eternal life. That's the truth that we're called to believe in and put our faith in. And it's out of that truth that we live our lives through. Here's another way of putting it. That faith never remains alone. Faith never remains alone. It's a bit like the sprinkler we have in the garden. Uh, Maddie, our daughter, she wants to play in it, but she also doesn't want to get wet. And so you have this dynamic where she runs towards the sprinkler and then as soon as she gets wet, she runs away in panic and distress. You see, true faith means getting wet. It means we run into the sprinkler and we don't run away. The sprinkler is designed to get things wet. And faith is designed so that we would do something with it. We are called to be people who believe. It says in Hebrews chapter 11 that faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. And so what does it look like for you? to put your faith into action? What does, believe, what does believing and putting your trust in a God of justice and love look like for you? What does it mean for you to both profess faith and to also possess it? Paul saw the work produced by faith, the action that came out of their belief in and around this church and he remembers it. Don't you want that to be our story as people that didn't stay silent but actually moved in action because of our faith in God? But secondly, Paul remembers and thanks God for the Thessalonians because of the labour prompted by love. Is The labour prompted by love. And the second thing Paul remembers is is essentially a love that doesn't burn out, the love that, that drives this church to serve the community. I know this, this might come as a surprise to you, but uh, whenever I do something vaguely helpful, either around the house or get food ready or whatever it is, I tend to play the overly humble card and say to Sarah, well, you know, Saz, it was, it was just a labor of love as if I had really sacrificed myself by mowing the lawn or, or doing something like that. But here Paul is saying that the love that he saw amongst this church was one of toil. It was one of sacrifice and it was one of hard work. That the love he saw wasn't cute or sentimental, but that it was full of sacrifice and hard work in order to serve the community. You know, it's been amazing to see churches involved in the cleanup operations in cities across the United States after uh, the protests and the riots have taken place. I think I saw one post that said, We march on the streets and then we clean up the streets. And there is a love that is serving. But I wonder if you've noticed that often the world's version of love is very different. It often looks like this, that, you know, I find something of worth and I take it or I possess it. But Jesus' definition of love was finding that which had no earthly value or worth and to serve. In another letter that Paul writes in the New Testament, he said of Jesus that he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Or Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said this, that God loves human beings. God loves the world, not an ideal human, but human beings as they are. Not an ideal world, but the real world. 
what we find repulsive in their opposition to God, what we shrink back from with pain and hostility, this is for God the ground of unfathomable love. This is the power of the gospel. This is the disarming power of Jesus that instead of enforcing a rule of law or a tyranny, the Son of God came in human flesh to serve humanity. And in his humanity, we find ours. In the love that he displayed on the cross, we find the resources we need to love others. When we understand that in our depravity and in our sin, God still loved us, we have the capacity to forgive and love others. There are those well-known words of Jesus in John chapter 13 where he says, By this everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. That is the, the evidence, the definition of a disciple is that we were to love one another. And when we approach others in love rather than suspicion, when we speak well of and champion other people, when we speak on behalf of others, when we stand up for others, when we move towards people who are perhaps different to us, we are following what Jesus called us to do. Don't you want to love people better? I certainly do. And the way to start is by praying for them. Start by praying for them. Start by praying for their well-being and their protection and their blessing. Start by listening to people's stories. Start by bringing others who are different to you, who look different to you, into your home once we're allowed to. Start there. That is how we can start to love people better. And then finally, Paul in verse 3 remembers their endurance inspired by hope. An endurance inspired by hope or a hope that doesn't give up. And as we go through this letter, you're going to see that Paul has his eyes fixed on the hope that the gospel brings. Paul has this unshakable confidence and expectation of what the future holds and it keeps him going. And in some senses, with all that we have around us, the developments in science and technology, we should be the most satisfied generation in history, shouldn't we? And yet we know it's a very different story. And it, particularly in a time like this, with what feels like a real turning point in our history, with the global pandemic we are facing, combined with the protest marches and outrage towards institutional racism, the question we are faced with is how do you keep going? How do you keep going when you have experienced racism personally? How do you keep going when you've been trying to speak at, about this for as long as you can remember and it continually falls on deaf ears? And when it comes to some of the challenges with the pandemic, how do you keep going when a relative is ill? and you can't care for them? How do you keep going when you've experienced loss of a loved one? How do you keep going when you feel anxious and isolated? When life is going well, it's easy to be hopeful, isn't it? But the rubber really hits the road when trying times come and endurance is often the test of these things. How do we keep going? And Paul says at the end of verse 3 that your hope is to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. To be human is to have your hope anchored, not in humanity's abilities to overcome challenges, but rather to know that there is a day set when Jesus will return and make all things new. Have your hope there, Paul says. Have your hope in the one who stepped into our humanity, who took on human flesh, who walked with us, talked with us, ate with us, 
who was tempted like us, who was marginalised, who experienced weakness like us, and yet remained pure, holy, righteous, always loving, always kind. The only one that was able to take us through life and death and into the internal presence of God himself. Paul says, build your life on that truth, on that living hope, on that sure and certain expectation and nowhere else. Let me just read to you from Revelation chapter 21. Here's the hope and the promise for us. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away he who was seated on the throne said i am making everything new and then he said write this down for these words are trustworthy and true and he said to me it is done i am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end to him who is thirsty i will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this and I will be his God and he will be my son. And with those words, we're gonna take an opportunity now to take communion and also to pray. And communion is an opportunity for those who follow Jesus to take wine and bread and remember that through the broken body and the spilt blood of Jesus on the cross that we find a new humanity that has been brought together. A unity that crosses borders, skin colours, languages, cultural backgrounds. And that one day there will be a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and saying salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So let's just take a moment to to eat bread and drink the wine. Let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we've sinned against you and against each other in thought, in word, and in deed. And whether it's through negligence, through weakness, or our own deliberate fault, we are sorry. And we repent of all our sin. And for the sake of your son Jesus who died for us. Forgive us all that is past. 
Help us to serve you in the life you have given us so that we might live by faith, that we might show love to one another and look to the eternal hope in your kingdom. And though we also want to just take a moment to pray for our brothers and sisters, both in our own church family, in Bristol and beyond, who are particularly affected by what is coming out in the news and what we're seeing across the world. Lord, we want to take a moment to pray for them, that you would draw near to them right now. Lord, that they would know that you, you are with them. Lord, we ask, Lord, would you come in your justice and in your mercy. Lord, we look to a day where there will be an end to racism, to injustice, to pain, to suffering, to grief. We look to that day and we say, come Lord Jesus, would you come? We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.